Lucan's Pharsalia, translated by Sir Edward Ridley. Book Seven, Part Two. Thus alike, with hearts aflame, moved either host to battle, one in fear and one in hope of empire. These hands shall do such work as not the rolling centuries, not all mankind, though free from sword and war, shall e'er make good. Nations that were to live, this fight shall crush, and peoples preordained to make the history of the coming world shall come not to the birth. The Latin names shall sound as fables in the ears of men, and ruins loaded with the dust of years shall hardly mark her cities. Alba's hill, home of our gods, no human foot shall tread, save of some senator at the ancient feast by Numa's orders founded. He compelled serves his high office. Void and desolate are Vei, Cora, and Laurentum's hold. Yet not the tooth of envious time destroyed these storied monuments. Twas civil war that raised their citadels. Where now hath fled the teeming life that once Italia knew? Not all the earth can furnish her with men, untenanted her dwellings and her fields, slaves till her soil. One city holds us all, crumbling to ruin. The ancestral roof finds none on whom to fall. And Rome herself, void of her citizens, draws within her gates the dregs of all the world, that none might wage a civil war again. Thus deeply drank Pharsalia's fight, the lifeblood of her sons. Dark in the calendar of Rome, for I, the days when Alia and Cannae fell, and shall Pharsalus mourn, darkest of all? Stand on the page unmarked? Alas, the fates! Not plague, nor pestilence, nor famine's rage, not cities given to the flames, nor towns, trembling at shock of earthquake, shall weigh down such heroes lost when fortune's ruthless hand lops at one blow the gift of centuries, leaders and men in battle. How great art thou, Rome, in thy fall! Stretched to the widest bounds, war upon war laid nations at thy feet, till flaming Titan, nigh to either pole, beheld thine empire, and the furthest east was almost thine, till day and night and sky for thee revolved, and all the stars could see throughout their course was Roman. But the fates, in one dread day of slaughter and despair, Turned back the centuries and spoke thy doom, and now the Indian fears the axe no more, once emblem of thy power. Now no more the girded consul curbs the Getan horde, or in Sarmatian fur furrows guides the share. Still Parthia boasts her triumphs unavenged. Foul is the public life. And freedom fled to furthest earth beyond the Tigris stream, and Rhine's broad river, wandering at her will mid Teuton hordes and Scythian, though by sword, sought, yet returns not. Would that from the day when Romulus, aided by the vulture's flight, ill omened, raised within that hateful grove Rome's earliest walls. Down to the crimson field in dire Thessalia fought, she ne'er had known Italia's peoples. Did the Bruti strike in vain for liberty? Why laws and rights sanctioned by all the annals designate with consular titles? Happier far the Medes and blessed Arabia and the eastern lands held by a kindlier fate in despot rule. That nation serves the worst, which serves with shame. No guardian gods watch over us from heaven. Jove is no king. Let ages whirl along in blind confusion. From his throne supreme, shall he behold such carnage and restrain his thunderbolts? On Mimas shall he hurl his fires. On Rhodope and Oeta's woods, unmeriting such chastisement. And leave this life to Cassius' hand? 
on Argos fell, at grim Thyestes' feast, untimely night, by him thus hastened. Shall Thessalia's land receive full daylight, wielding kindred swords in fathers' hands and brothers? Careless of men are all the gods, yet for this day of doom such vengeance have we reaped as deities may give to mortals. For these wars shall raise our parted Caesars to the gods, and Rome shall deck their effigies with thunderbolts and stars and rays, and in the very fanes swear by the shades of men. With swift advance they seize the space that yet delays the fates till short the span dividing. Then they gaze for one short moment where may fall the spear. What hand may deal their death? What monstrous task soon shall be theirs? And all in arms they see, in reach of stroke, their brothers and their sires with front opposing, yet to yield their ground. It pleased them not. But all the host was dumb with horror, cold upon each loving heart, awestruck the life-blood pressed, and all men held, with arms outstretched, their javelins for a time, poised yet unthrown. Now may the venging gods allot thee, Crastinus, not such a death as all men else do suffer. In the tomb mayst thou have feeling and remembrance still. For thine the hand that first flung forth the dart, which stained with Roman blood the Salia's earth. Madman! to speed thy lance when Caesar's self still held his hand. Then from the clarions broke the strident summons, and the trumpets blared responsive signal. Upward to the vault the sound re-echoes where nor clouds may reach nor thunder penetrate, and Hamus slopes reverberate to Pelion the din. Pindus re-echoes, Oeda's lofty rocks groan, and Pangean cliffs, till at their rage, borne back from all the earth, they shook for fear. Unnumbered darts they hurl, with prayers diverse. Some hope to wound, others in secret yearn for hands still innocent. Chance rules supreme, and wayward fortune, upon whom she wills, makes fall the guilt. Yet for the hatred bred by civil war suffices spear nor lance, urged on their flight afar. The hand must grip the sword and drive it to the foeman's heart. But while Pompeius' ranks, shield wedged to shield, were ranged in dense array and scarce had space to draw the blade, came rushing at the charge, full on the central column, Caesar's host, mad for the battle. Man nor arms could stay the crash of onset, and the furious sword clove through the stubborn panoply to the flesh, there only stayed. One army struck, their foes struck not in answer. Magnus' swords were cold, but Caesar's reeked with slaughter and with guilt. Nor fortune lingered, but decreed the doom which swept the ruins of a world away. Soon as withdrawn from all the spacious plain, Pompeius' horse was ranged upon the flanks. Passed through the outer files, the lighter armed of all the nations joined the central strife, with diverse weapons armed, but all for blood of Rome athirst. Then blazing torches flew, arrows and stones and ponderous balls of lead, molten by speed of passage through the air. Their Iterean archers and the mead winged forth their countless shafts till all the sky grew dark with missiles hurled, and from the night Brooding above, death struck his victims down. Guiltless such blow, while all the crime was heaped upon the Roman spear. In line oblique, behind the standards, Caesar in reserve had placed some companies of foot, in fear the foremost ranks might waver. These, at his word, no trumpet sounding, break upon the ranks of Magnus' horsemen where they rode at large, flanking the battle. They, unashamed of fear, and careless of the fray, when first a steed, pierced through by javelin, spurned with sounding hoof the temples of his rider, turned the rein, 
and through their comrades spurring from the field in panic proved that not with warring Rome barbarians may grapple. Then arose immeasurable carnage. Here the sword, there stood the victim, and the victor's arm wearied of slaughter. Oh, that to thy plains, Pharsalia, might suffice this crimson stream from host barbarian, nor other blood pollute thy fountain sources. These alone shall clothe thy pastures with the bones of men. Or, if thy fields must run with Roman blood, then spare the nations who in times to come must be her peoples. Now the terror spread through all the army, and the favoring fates decreed for Caesar's triumph. And the war ceased in the wider plain, though still ablaze where stood the chosen of Pompeius' force, upholding yet the fight. Not here allies begged from some distant king to wield the sword. Here were the Roman sons, the sires of Rome, here the last frenzy and the last despair. Here, Caesar was thy crime, and here shall stay my muse repelled. No poesy of mine shall tell the horrors of the final strife, nor for the coming ages paint the deeds which civil war permits. Be all obscured in deepest darkness. Spare the useless tear and vain lament, and let the deeds that fell in that last fight of Rome remain unsung. But Caesar, adding fury to the breasts, already flaming with the rage of war, that each might bear his portion of the guilt which stained the host, unflinching through the ranks, passed at his will. He looked upon the brands. These reddened only at the point, and those streaming with blood and gory to the hilt. He marks the hand which trembling grasped the sword, or held it idle, and the cheek that grew pale at the blow, and that which at his words glowed with the joy of battle. Midst the dead he treads the plain, and on each gaping wound presses his hand to keep the life within. Thus Caesar passed, and where his footsteps fell, as when Bologna shakes her crimson lash, or Mavor scour scourges on the Thracian mares, when shunning the dread face on Pallas shield, he drives his chariot. There arose a night, dark with huge slaughter, and with crime, and groans as of a voice immense, and sound of arms as fell the wearer, and of sword on sword crashed into fragments. With a ready hand, Caesar supplies the weapon, and bids strike full at the visage, and with lance reversed, urges the flagging ranks, and stirs the fight. Where flows the nation's blood, where beats the heart, knowing he bids them spare the common herd, but seek the senators. Thus Rome he strikes, thus the last hold of freedom. In the fray, then fell the nobles with their mighty names of ancient prowess, their Metellus sons, Corvini, Lepidi, Torquati too. Not once nor twice the conquerors of kings. First of all men, Pompeius' name except, lay dead upon the field. But Brutus, where? Where was thy sword? Veiled by a common helm, unknown thou wanderest. Thy country's pride, hope of the Senate, thou, for none besides, Thou latest scion of that race of pride, Whose fearless deeds the centuries record, Tempt not the battle, nor provoke the doom, Awaits thee on Philippi's fated field, Thy Thessaly. Not here shalt thou prevail against Caesar's life, Not yet hath he surpassed the height of power, And deserved a death noble at Brutus' hands. Then let him live, thy fated victim." There upon the field lay all the honor of Rome, no common stream mixed with the purple tide. And yet of all who noble fell, one only now I sing, thee, brave Domitius, whene'er the day was adverse to the fortunes of thy chief, thine was the arm which vainly stayed the fight. 
vanquished so oft by Caesar, now t'was thine, yet free to perish. By a thousand wounds came welcome death, nor had thy conqueror power again to pardon. Caesar stood and saw the dark blood welling forth and death at hand, and thus in words of scorn, and dost thou lie, Domitius, there? And did Pompeius name thee his successor, thee? Why leavest thou then his standards helpless? But the parting life still faintly throbbed within Domitius' breast, thus finding utterance. Yet thou hast not won thy hateful prize, for doubtful are the fates. Nor thou the master, Caesar, free as yet, with great Pompeius for my leader still, warring no more, I seek the silent shades, yet with this hope in death, that thou, subdued to Magnus and to me, in grievous guise, mayst pay atonement. So he spake, no more, then closed his eyes in death. T'were shame to shed, when thus a world was perishing, The tear meet for each fate, Or sing the wound that reft each life away. Through forehead and through throat The pitiless weapon clove its deadly path, Or forced the entrails forth. One fell to earth, prone at the stroke, One stood, though shorn of limb, Glanced from this breast unharmed the quivering spear That it transfixed to earth. Here from the veins spouted the life-blood, till the foeman's arms were crimsoned. One his brother slew, nor dared to spoil the course, till severed from the neck he flung the head afar. Another dashed, full in his father's teeth, the fatal sword, by murderous frenzy striving to disprove his kinship with the slain. Yet for each death we find no separate dirge, nor weep for men, when peoples fell, thus, Rome, thy doom was wrought at dread Pharsalus. Not, as in other fields, by soldiers slain or captains. Here were swept whole nations to the death. Assyria here, Achaia, Pontus, and the blood of Rome, gushing in torrents forth, forbade the rest to stagnate on the plain. Nor life was reft, nor safety only then, But reeled the world, and all her manifold peoples At the blow in that day's battle dealt, Nor only then felt, but in all the times that were to come. Those swords gave servitude to every age that shall be slavish, By our sires was shaped, for us, our destiny, the despot yoke. Yet have we trembled not, nor feared to bear our throats to slaughter, nor to face the foe. We bear the penalty for others' shame. Such be our doom. Yet fortune, sharing not in that last battle, t'was our right to strike one blow for freedom, ere we served our Lord. Now saw Pompeius, grieving, that the gods had left his side, and knew the fates of Rome passed from his governance. Yet all the blood that filled the field scarce brought him to confess his fortunes fled. A little hill he sought, whence to descry the battle raging still upon the plain, which when he nearer stood, the warring ranks concealed. Thence did the chief gaze on unnumbered swords that flashed in air and sought his ruin, and the tide of blood in which his host had perished. Yet not as those who, prostrate fallen, would drag nations down to share their evil fate, Pompeius did. Still were the gods thought worthy of his prayers to give him solace, that in after him might live his Romans. Spare ye gods, he said, nor lay whole peoples low. My fall attained, the world in Rome may stand. And if ye need more bloodshed, here, on me, my wife and sons, wreak out your vengeance. Pledges to the fates, such have we given. 
Too little for the war is our destruction? Doth the carnage fail, the world escaping? Magnus fortune's lost, why doom all else beside him? Thus he cried, and passed amid his standards, and recalled his vanquished host that rushed on fate declared. Not for his sake such carnage should be wrought, so thought Pompeius. Nor the foeman's sword, he feared, nor death, but lest upon his fall to quit their chief his soldiers might refuse, and o'er his prostrate corpse a world in arms might find its ruin. Or perchance he wished from Caesar's eager eyes to veil his death. In vain, unhappy, for the fate's decree he shall behold, shorn from the bleeding trunk, again thy visage. And thou too, his spouse, beloved Cornelia, didst cause his flight, thy longed-for features. Yet he shall not die when thou art present. Then upon his steed, though fearing not the weapons on his back, Pompeius fled, his mighty soul prepared to meet his destinies. No groan nor tear, but solemn grief, as for the fates of Rome, was in his visage, and with me and unchanged he saw Pharsalia's woes above the frowns or smiles of fortune. In triumphant days, and in his fall, her master. The burden laid of thine untending fate, thou partest free to muse upon the happy days of yore. Hope now has fled, but in the fleeting past, how wast thou great! Seek thou the wars no more and call the gods to witness that for thee henceforth dies no man. In the fights to come, on Afric's mournful shore, by Pharos stream, and fateful Munda, in the final scene of dire Pharsalia's battle, not thy name doth stir the war and urge the foeman's arm, but those great rivals biding with us yet, Caesar and Liberty. And not for thee, but for itself, the dying senate fought, when thou hadst fled the combat. Find'st thou not some solace thus in parting from the fight, nor seeing all the horrors of its close? Look back upon the dead that load the plain, the rivers turbid with a crimson stream. Then pity thou thy victor. How shall he enter the city who on such a field finds happiness? Trust thou in fortune yet, her favorite ever, and whate'er, alone, in lands unknown, an exile, be thy lot, whate'er thy sufferings neath the Pharian king, t'were worse to conquer. Then forbid the tear, cease sounds of woe, and lamentation cease, and let the world adore thee in defeat as in thy triumphs. With unfaltering gaze, look on the suppliant kings, thy subjects still. Search out the realms and cities which they hold, thy gift, Pompeius, and a fitting place choose for thy death. First witness of thy fall, and of thy noble bearing in defeat, Larissa, weeping, yet with gifts of price, fit for a victor, from her teeming gates, Poured forth her citizens, their homes and fanes flung open, Wishing it had been their lot with thee to share disaster. Of thy name still much survives, Unto thy former self alone inferior, Still couldst thou to arms all nations call, And challenge fate again. But thus he spake, To cities nor to men avails the conquered aught, Then pledge your faith, to him who has the victory. Caesar trod Pharsalia's slaughter, while his daughter's spouse thus gave him kingdoms. But Pompeius fled, mid sobs and groans and blaming of the gods for this their fierce commandment. And he fled, full of the fruits and knowledge of the love the peoples bore him, which he knew not his in times of happiness. When Italian blood flowed deep enough upon the fatal field, Caesar bade halt, and gave their lives to those whose death had been no gain, but that their camp might not recall the foe, nor calm of night 
banish their fears, he bids his cohorts dash, while fortune glowed and terror filled the plain, straight on the ramparts of the conquered foe. Light was the task to urge them to the spoil. Soldiers, he said, the victory is ours, full and triumphant. There doth lie the prize which you have won, not Caesar. At your feet behold the booty of the hostile camp. Snatched from Hesperian nations, ruddy gold, and all the riches of the Orient world are piled within the tents. The wealth of kings and of Pompeius here awaits its lords. Haste, soldiers, and outstrip the flying foe. E'en now the vanquished of Pharsalia's field anticipate your spoils. No more he said, but drave them blind with frenzy for the gold, to spurn the bodies of their fallen sires and trample chiefs in dashing on their prey. What rampart had restrained them as they rushed to seize the pride for wickedness and war and learn the price of guilt? And though they found, in ponderous masses heaped for need of war, the trophies of a world, yet were their minds unsatisfied that asked for all. Whate'er Iberian mines or Tagus bring to-day, or Aramaspians from golden sands may gather, had they seized, still had they thought their guilt too cheaply sold. When pledged to them was the Tarpeian rock for victory won, and all the spoils of Rome, by Caesar's word, shall camps suffice them? Then plebeian limbs, on senator's turf took rest, on kingly couch, the meanest soldier, and the murderer lay, where yesternight his brother or his sire. In raving dreams within their waking brains, yet raged the battle, and the guilty hand still wrought its deeds of blood, and restless sought the absent sword-hilt. Thou hadst said that groans issued from all the plain, that parted souls had breathed the life into the guilty soil, that earthly darkness teemed with gibbering ghosts and stygian terrors. Victory foully won, thus claimed its punishment. The slumbering sense already heard the hiss of vengeful flames as from the depths of Acheron. One saw, deep in the trances of the night, his sire, and one his brother slain. But all the dead in long array were vision to the eyes of Caesar dreaming. Not in other guise, Orestes saw the furies ere he fled to purge his sin within the Scythian bounds. Nor in more fierce convulsions raged the soul of Pentheus raving, nor Agave's mind when she had known her son. Before his gaze flashed all the javelins which Pharsalia saw, or that avenging day when drew their blades the Roman senators. And on his couch, infernal monsters from the depths of hell scourged him in slumber. Thus his guilty mind brought retribution. Ere his rival died, the terrors that enfold the Stygian stream, and black Avernus and the ghostly slain, broke on his sleep. Yet when the golden sun unveiled the butchery of Pharsalia's field, he shrank not from its horror, nor withdrew his feasting gaze. There rolled the streams in blood, in flood with crimson carnage. There a seething heap rose shrouding all the plain, now in decay, slow settling down. There numbered he the host of Magnus slain, and for the morn's repast, that spot he chose whence he might watch the dead, and feast his eyes upon a Mathias field concealed by corpses. Of the bloody sight, insatiate, he forbade the funeral pyre, and cast a Mathia in the face of heaven. Nor by the Punic victor was he taught, who at the close of Cannae's fatal fight laid in the earth the Roman consul dead to find fit burial for his fallen foes. For these were all his countrymen, nor yet his ire by blood appeased. Yet ask we not for separate pyres or sepulchres apart, wherein that lay the ashes of the fallen. 
burn in one holocaust the nation slain or should it please thy soul to torture more thy kinsmen pile on high from oeta's slopes and pindus top the woods thus shall he see while fugitive on the deep the blaze that marks the salia yet by this idle rage naught dost thou profit for these corporal frames bearing innate from birth the certain germs of dissolution whether by decay or fire consumed shall fall into the lap of all-embracing nature thus if now thou shouldst deny the pyre still in that flame when all shall crumble earth and rolling seas and stars commingled with the bones of men these too shall perish where thy soul shall go these shall companion thee no higher flight in airy realms is thine nor smoother couch beneath the stygian darkness for the dead no fortune favors and our mother earth all that is born from her receives again and he whose bones no tomb or urn protects yet sleeps beneath the canopy of heaven and thou proud conqueror who wouldst deny the rights of burial to thousands slain why flee thy field of triumph why desert this reeking plain drink caesar of the streams drink if thou canst and should it be thy wish breathe the thessalian air but from thy grasp the earth is ravished and the unburied host routing their victor hold pharsalia's field then to the ghastly harvest of the war came all the beasts of earth whose facile sense of odor tracks the bodies of the slain sped from his northern home the thracian wolf bears left their dens and lions from afar scenting the carnage dogs obscene and foul their homes deserted all the air was full of gathering fowl who in their flight had long pursued the armies cranes who yearly change the frosts of thracia for the banks of nile this year delayed their voyage as ne'er before the air grew dark with vultures hovering wings innumerable for every grove and wood sent forth its denizens on every tree dripped from their crimson beaks a gory dew oft on the conquerors and their impious arms or purple rain of blood or mouldering flesh fell from the lofty heaven or limbs of men from weary talons dropped yet even so the peoples passed not all into the maw of ravening beast nor fowl the inmost flesh scarce did they touch nor limbs thus lay the dead scorned by the spoiler and the roman host by sun length of days and rain from heaven at length was mingled with amathia's plain ill starred thessalia by what hateful crime didst thou offend that thus on thee alone was laid such carnage by what length of years shalt thou be cleansed from the curse of war when shall the harvest of thy fields arise free from their purple stain and when the share cease to upturn the slaughtered hosts of rome first shall the battle onset sound again again shall flow upon thy faded earth a crimson torrent thus may be o'erthrown our sire's memorials those erected last or those which pierced by ancient roots have spread through broken stones their sacred urns abroad thus shall the plowman of haemonia gaze on more abundant ashes and the rake pass o'er more frequent bones wert thracia thou our only battlefield no sailor's hand upon thy shore should make his cable fast no spade should turn the hus husbandman should flee thy fields the resting place of roman dead no lowing kind should graze nor shepherd dare to leave his fleecy charge to browse at will on fields made fertile by our mouldering dust all bare and unexplored thy soil should lie as past man's footsteps 
parched by cruel suns, or palled by snows unmelting. But, ye gods, give us to hate the lands that bear the guilt. Let not all earth be cursed, though not all be blameless found. Twas thus that Munda's fight, and blood of Mutina, and Lucas' cape, and sad Pecinus made Philippi pure. End of Book 7